Three, two, one. Let's do this. Most of the Old Testament of the Bible was written, as we know, in ancient Hebrew. And that means that since nobody still speaks ancient Hebrew, anytime we read the Bible, anytime we read the Old Testament, we are dependent on the work of translators. And the translators of the Bible, I must say, have done an extraordinary job. The translations we have are really good, really reliable. But the simple fact is that there's no such thing as a perfect translation from one language to another. Whenever we translate anything, we will necessarily miss out on some of the nuance, some of the deeper meaning in a text. And of course, sometimes, there's a word or a phrase that has more than one meaning, and it can sometimes be impossible to know which meaning is intended. And that means that sometimes familiar biblical passages that we think we know very well can surprise us a great deal when we look behind the translations, or sometimes look at the translator's footnotes in our Bibles. To show you what I mean, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a good look at one of the most famous passages in the Bible. One you thought, you may have thought that you understood exactly what it meant. I'm talking about the opening passage of the Bible, the story of creation. This is certainly a well-known, well-loved passage, but it's also notoriously difficult to translate. Everybody knows the opening words of the Bible in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's how it's translated in the King James Version, and most other modern translations have nearly the same thing. And I would like to stress that this is a perfectly adequate translation of the opening ancient Hebrew words. And it also has going for it that it is a familiar translation and that we at least think we know what it means. It seems to mean that God's first act of creation was to create the heavens and the earth. And since, in ancient Hebrew, there was no word for what we would call the universe, that phrase, the heaven and the earth, means basically that God started by creating the whole universe. But there is a problem with that, because you see, the original Hebrew also has another totally acceptable translation. It is there in the footnotes of the New Revised Standard Version. There you will discover that this verse may also be translated as, when God began creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void. Now, that is just a little bit different, isn't it? It kind of implies that there was something already there when God began the work of creation. Now, it doesn't mean that God didn't create everything, but it does mean that the creation of the heavens and the earth themselves are not quite part of the seven-day creation story, that they were already established in some way before the seven days began. Now, as I say, each of these two translations is about equally possible. There's no way to make sure which translation captures the original meaning. But I think that if you look at the entire passage, it actually makes more sense if we translate this as when God began creating. Because you see, every other time God creates something in this story, it all follows the same pattern. You know the pattern. God speaks, let there be. And then something happens, and then call it, God calls the thing that has happened good. That happens in every case, except, of course, the creation of the heavens and the earth themselves. That act of creation is not part of the pattern of the story, and so the creation of heaven and earth are apart. They're, let's call it a different story. And we need to look closer at the original form of the earth. We are told that the earth was formless and void when God began creating. Now that is a very interesting phrase. 
The original Hebrew actually reads as tohu bohu. The earth was tohu bohu. <laughs> now, if you've ever wanted a great Hebrew phrase to use to impress people at parties, that's got to be it. Tohu bohu. And the great thing about tohu bohu is, is that it doesn't just mean formless and void. It can also be translated as chaotic and empty or as a confused wasteland. It seems to be saying that when God began creating, the earth was basically just a neglected mess. And once you understand that, you begin to see that the work of creation carried out by God in this story in a very different light. And you begin to notice that God is not just making things, but that God is organizing things. And then in some ways, the organization is more than the more important than the making. God creates light, for example, and then carefully separates light from darkness and puts each in its place, right? God separates, carefully separates the water, first by creating the sky. And then God create, separates the waters on the earth below. God is, in other words, carefully putting the waters in their appropriate places. God creates the animals, and then they are all carefully sorted, each according to their time. And that phrase, each according to their time, kind, is repeated several times. So a lot of God's work of creation is actually about putting everything that is made in its proper place. A great deal of God's work of creation is bringing order and organization out of chaos and disorder. So the original tohu bohu state of the earth is actually quite significant. Now the next phrase in the story also has multiple meanings. The New Revised Standard Version trans translates it like this. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. But if you look that up in other translations, you will find that that word spirit is sometimes, you will find the word spirit sometimes instead of the word wind. That's simply because of this. In Hebrew, there is only one word. One word, the word is ruach, another great Hebrew word. Ruach, which can be translated either as wind or breath or spirit. One word for all those things. And there's no way to know which meaning is intended. Now, honestly, I prefer the translation spirit here in Genesis because it really makes most sense in the context. What is a wind from God, if not the spirit? But there's also the question of the significance of this reference to the ruach, and what it has to do with the creation story. The Ruach is said to sweep over the waters that seem to cover the whole earth. But you see that word that is translated as sweep can also be translated a little bit differently. It's also some trans sometimes translated as hover, or it could be translated as brood. A brood being, of course, the action of a mother bird sitting on her eggs. Now there's an interesting image for you, isn't there? The Spirit of God, like a mother bird, brooding over the waters. And that's especially interesting when you consider just a few paragraphs later, you see something extraordinary springing from this water. There on the fifth day of creation, we see animate life first appear. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. You see, when a dove broods on an egg, and five days later, a living squab pops out of that egg, we know there's a connection. So I wonder if we're not meant to assume that there's an also a connection between the Spirit of God brooding on the waters and the life that appears in those same waters five days later. So you can see that if you look closer at the original language behind this passage of scripture, that is so familiar. There is a great 
deal to be discovered. It is giving us, I believe, a fuller picture of the God who is not only bringing all things into being, but is also bringing order and putting everything in its rightful place. And we also have, in these opening words of the Bibles, a surprising new insight into this wor the work of the Spirit or the wind from God and the Spirit's role in bringing forth life. Now, of course, the obvious question is, what do we do with all of this? Honestly, I do not think that by looking closer at this Genesis creation story, that we'll necessarily have a better understanding of how, how this planet and life upon it came into being. I mean, yes, this passage certainly does affirm that God is the ultimate source of all that exists. I don't have any issues with that. But I do not think that we should take conclusions from this passage about how, how things came into existence. I do not think that this passage confirms or denies the Big Bang Theory, for example, or the theory of evolution. Nor do I think that we should take the seven-day framing of this story as an invitation to calculate the date of the beginning of all things. Because, you see, this passage is not actually concerned with such matters. I think it's clear. When you look closely at this passage, that it is meant to teach us more about the creator than it is to teach us about the creation. This passage is about who God is, the one who brings order out of chaos, the one who brings life out of the churning water, and especially the one who makes all things good. <coughs> this story, we need to understand, is not just about something that happened 6,000 years ago, or 4.5 billion years ago, depending on who you talk to, that we need to understand that this passage is saying something that's talking to you here and now, and it's talking about you. Today is the first Sunday after Epiphany, which is traditionally known in the church as the Baptism of Jesus Sunday. So traditionally uh, in the church on this day, we read the story that we read this morning from Mark's gospel of Jesus being baptized. And in this reading, the author does something truly extraordinary. And I, I'm convinced that he does it quite intentionally. Mark writes this, And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. In these few words, we see all the imagery and the words themselves that we find in the opening passage of the Bible. We have the heavens above and the earth below. And upon the face of the earth, we have the churning waters. We have the heavens split in two, just as they are split on the second day of creation. And of course, we have the spirit or wind from God, because interestingly enough, the Greek in the Greek of the New Testament, just like in the Hebrew of the Old, there's only one word, one word that means both spirit and wind. We have the spirit of God or the wind of God descending and hovering over the waters. And here it is made quite explicit that the spirit is like a bird brooding on the waters in the form of a dove. And finally, of course, we have the voice of the creator booming from heaven and demanding that a new creation come into being as Jesus is declared the son of God. It's all there. And I guarantee you that this is no accident. Mark has gone out of his way. You know, at, at this moment of Jesus' baptism, to take us back to the beginning of all things. Why? Because I think Mark wants us to understand that the baptism of Jesus isn't just something that happened at one moment in history. It is one of those unique moments in the history of the world where, where all times are kind of brought together. He wants us to understand not only 
that the baptism of Jesus takes us back to the beginning of the time, of time, but that it also brings us forward. Mark wants you to understand that the moment when Jesus went down into that water and came up from that water was a moment of creation. A creation for the church, a new movement, of course, but also in a real sense, it was a creation of the baptism of every believer. And every time, every place, all took place in that moment of time. Basically, Mark wants you to understand that you were there. That at whatever moment in your life that you were truly baptized, you, you were the one who went down into the primeval, chaotic waters. And that God spent, sent the Holy Spirit down upon you to create you as a new being. In Christ Jesus. And what's more, Mark wants you to understand that God, in creating you anew, brings you out of the chaos of life in this world. And, and let me tell you, there's been a lot of chaos in life in this world this week. And has set you on a path in your life that makes sense, that is focused towards what is good and right and just. The new creation, in other words, is you. And it all came together at that moment by the Jordan River as Jesus went down into those waters and did it for you. And as Jesus rose from those waters as a new being, and so did you. You were there. Lord, help us to understand the new creation you want us to live out in this world. The world is filled with so much chaos, so much disorder, so much uncertainty. But you have brought us out of the waters of that chaos to give us new life, new beginnings, new hope in Jesus Christ, who was baptized for us. And for this, we thank and praise you. Amen.